Mado, it's an absolute pleasure and a privilege indeed to, to speak to you. Thank you so much for joining me today. Well, wonderful to talk to you. You represent books, which is wonderful. It's a wonderful, well, do you know, it's, it's a wonderful thing to talk about. And your book in particular, see, I remember you on my TV screens um, when I was younger and watching TV at home. And I remember your book. And I've been talking to a few people about your book recently. And it's amazing how many people say, and th these are the exact words they use, they say, it's still the best Indian cookery cookbook. Oh, that's so sweet. That, that's so nice. And how young were you? <laughs> <laughs> I won't give away my exact birth date, <laughs> okay. Mother, but let's just say uh, at, at, your, at your prime, I was a, a very greedy child and very grateful for all of the uh, food that was coming my way. And you could eat the hot food. Yeah, I love hot food. We will get oh, into, in fact, uh, talking yes. about children and hot food uh, because my own children are slightly resistant and you're going to help oh, me deal with that. Oh, let me talk to them. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm going to take you right back because, of course, you were born in 1933 in India when it was actually British India. So it was, we were under the Raj. We, had, we were far from independence at that time. So I'm really a child of the Raj. I was born there. We fought for independence. I remember all that. Mm. Uh, I remember Independence Day in India all very well. They are part of my blood now. Mm. The, you described um, the, the sort of, I suppose, the impact of, of independence because you were at school. And is it true that basically it was like all of your Muslim classmates, they just left? They there was no left. goodbye that no. must have been quite uh, an upsetting. No, no, and we had arguments also. You see, this was the bad part of it. Yeah. That the class, was, which had Hindus and Muslims in it, you know, and we were friends. We would sit and eat our lunches together. Mm. The Muslim girls would open their food. We would open ours. We would sit and heat it and eat it together. And we were very close. And then the minute the talk of partition started in our school, we were like, one side on one side, the other side on the other side, nothing in the middle mm. except me. I was the only one in the middle and said, can't we still get on? I mean, you know, Pakistan is reformed and fine, but can't we be friends like we always were? Nothing of the kind. The Muslim girls hated me. The Hindu girls hated me. And I was right in the middle trying to create a path that we could be together. But there was no way at that time. And of course, the split was so awful because millions of people were killed. Mm. It wasn't just a friendly goodbye, goodbye. People were murdered. People mm. were killed. People were thrown into wells. People were slaughtered. People were asked, are you circumcised or not? And if they wouldn't drop their pants, they were just killed. Mm. Throat slit. You know, horrible things happened during that period. And that's when I was growing up, so it's become part of me now, that kind of confusion about who are we and why can't we, the world get along, why can't we get along? It's still, I still ask the same question, why can't we get along? Yeah. Because America is very split where I live. Yeah. And it's a, why can't we get along? But there's just, people divide themselves in the most awful way mm. and will not get undivided. It's really interesting, as you say, in America at the moment, there's the similar sort of polarization of, yes. of politics. And as you say, there, there's no middle ground, it seems, sometimes. With none at all. Politics. None yeah. at all. None that we can speak to. And they can be our blood relatives that we have this relationship with in families in mm. America. And there's no getting together. It's really interesting what you were saying there about as a, as a, as a girl at school, you used to sit together with your classmates and you would open your lunches together and I know that because people came from different regions of the country and and indeed as you say they're sort of different religions would you have some of those food influences would be visible right there on your table because you would have these different meals coming being brought in by absolutely different absolutely and sometimes like if a Muslim family made a, a meat goat meat usually with mm. spinach it was a Muslim hand that made it. So everything about it was exciting and different, slightly different. And I would always wonder, what is what is that difference that is making her food 
so much better than mine, you know, because <laughs> uh, I was dying to eat hers and not eat mine, and she was dying to eat mine and not hers. And this, it was this kind of hand that made it, that gave it this lovely little difference. You've been quite honest about the fact that um, domestic science lessons at school, as they would have been called then, <laughs> were, were not your forte. Is that they fair? They were not my forte. Let me tell you, this English lady in a drab grey sort of dress with grey eyes that were like, so slightly watery would teach us to make blamange <laughs> <laughs> and it was food for the sick you learn how to cook for the sick invalid cooking it was called yeah and why i was learning invalid cooking when this lovely goat meat was, with spinach was possible i didn't understand and i rebelled against <laughs> But one, one thing you did excel at at school was, this is your first taste, I suppose, of acting. You were encouraged into doing school plays and oh, Always, like. since the age of five. That's, which is incredible. I mean, that's very young, but you, you clearly had a taste for it. Did, I did... loved it. And there was a combination. When I was in school and I was five years old, I remember playing a brown mouse in a, in a school. It was a musical of some sort. Yeah. But during intermission, everybody, including the mice, got hot chocolate. And so this <laughs> wonderful combination of the yummy things in the mouth yeah. and performing have been part of my life since I was very little. That sounds like the perfect role to me. If you get a yes. free hot chocolate, I'm there. Yeah, you're a brown mouse with me. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. I'd have yes. loved that part. Um, yeah. when, when was the point at which you thought that acting might actually be a career because obviously that's a very different thing to just sort of doing school plays. I think when I finished uh, high school there was a choice of where I should go mm. and I have many interests I'm all equally interested in painting and drawing so my first thought was I should go to art school but my sister my older sister was very much like a mother to me and helped me with everything because my mother spoke no English mm. she wasn't an educated woman and so I turned to my sister for everything. And my sister, who lives in England, actually, she said, don't go to art school now. Go, uh, go get your BA uh, at a proper college and then think of art school later if you still want to go. Mm -hmm. So I said, well, what will I study? She said, well, study English. That was, she had done English as her main uh, subject. And, that's what I did. So I was in college at Miranda House in Delhi and doing English uh, as my major. And uh, I love that too. I mean, I love so many things and I just enjoyed reading all the English classics and writing essays on them and devouring them. I just devoured. I read Shakespeare from cover to cover. Mm. I just read everything because I thought Shakespeare was great. And I just read the sonnets, I read all the plays uh, one summer, and I had such a good time doing it. I have a good time doing many things, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> and it was uh, in 1955, I believe, that you were lucky enough to get a scholarship that would allow you to cross over to, to England and go to RADA, to the Royal Academy of Dramatic Arts, to study right. acting. And, well, this was also very strange because... We, my father could afford to send me, but we couldn't buy foreign exchange at that time. India had no foreign exchange. So we had to get it somehow in the form of scholarships or from the government. And I did a Tennessee Williams play, Otto de Fe, I remember, it's a one actor. Mm. Uh, and the British consul came to see it. And he said, you know, good things and recommended me to RADA. So that was one of the ways uh, that I got into RADA. I got some RADA scholarships as well. So it was absolutely wonderful. I had three or four scholarships by this time. I could go on holiday in the Austrian Alps, <laughs> <laughs> which I did. I wasn't a good skier or anything. I was a terrible skier. So I usually sat around drinking the, the tea with rum. Okay. Uh, and while my friend went skiing and I just waited for her to come back and then had some more rum and tea 
and ate well. Sounds like you're more into the apres ski rather than the ski. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah. Apres ski is me. <laughs> <laughs> Can you tell me a little bit about the, the, the cultural shift that must have occurred when you came to the UK? What, what was it like for you to arrive in a country that would have felt familiar, perhaps because of the cultural exchange, but very, very different in terms of food and Well, you see, here, here's the funny thing. It did not, because I'd read every book. Yeah. And he, as kids, we read Girl's Crystal, which was a comic, a British comic. So everything was familiar because I'd done so much reading. Mm -hmm. So when I came, I mean, I did feel cold. But I sat very near the gas fire in my little digs that I was in. But other than that, there was nothing unfamiliar to me other than the smog. Right. And the smog in those days came at three o'clock. It was pea green. Mm. And you just felt suffocated by it. But other than that, I knew England from the books. I just knew it. And... It was at RADA, uh, and whilst you were staying in those digs, as you say, that you became, I suppose, almost desperate for the food of your homeland. But you that didn't have... RADA, yes. <laughs> you didn't have, I suppose, that, that sort of, that, the, the, the knowledge of those recipes. And so you began a correspondence with your mum, is that right? And she started to right. share these recipes. I did. You see, I remembered the food so well it was all in my whatever it, this thing is it was yeah. in there yeah and I couldn't eat it I couldn't get it I couldn't make it it was very frustrating so I wrote letters to my mother and uh she I said please send me this recipe that recipe I'm going to try and make these things and she did but they were three line letters take right. this and that brown it a little bit then leave it to cook and then It'll be ready soon. <laughs> what was I to do with that? But because I remember the taste, this yeah. is the funny thing, and this is what I talk about, taste memory, uh, and which goes into your brain and becomes like a file in your brain. I didn't know all that. Mm. I didn't know I had it inside me, but mm. I had the taste. And I kept trying, and this wasn't right, and this wasn't right, and I kept adding this or that or cooking it longer or uh, shorter time. And I was able to arrive at the taste. And that's what I write about much later, that there is such a thing as taste. Memory, people who have a good palate, yeah, uh, just send it into some file, that particular dish into some file in the head, and there it stays. And then you can recall it and bring it back. So all this I was to learn much later, but it was happening at that time when I was just freshly there, broader. Yeah, that's really fascinating because any any chef will say that tasting food as you cook it is absolutely crucial in terms of, of getting course. things right. And many yeah. people are very used to following recipes and assuming if they put the stuff in, in the quantities it says, then everything will be fine. But you do need to use your own palate, don't you, to make sure it's right for you? Right, because tomatoes can be different. They can yeah. have a different taste. So you may need to add a little sugar. You may need to add a little more salt. They vary in their taste. Everything varies slightly in its mm. taste when you buy it. All the vegetables can be slightly different from each other. So can meats. Mm. So just tasting it, at a certain stage, you must. It was um, shortly after you graduated from RADA that you made another move over the Atlantic to, to the United States. Um, and I believe that it's there that you and your husband at the time, Saeed Jeffrey, were basically responsible for bringing together James Ivory and Ismail Merchant. That's is, quite correct. Is this true? Could you tell us a little yeah. bit more about how this well, happened? Well, you see, we met them separately. Jim was an, a friend. Yeah. It's uh, asked Saeed and me at different periods to do voiceovers. He was doing small films hmm. uh, and uh, nothing big. And he needed people to do this kind of voiceover, or that kind of voiceover. He asked my husband at that time to do the narration for a short film about Indian miniature paintings yeah. called The Sword and the Flute. There was another short film he made called The Daily Way, in which he asked me to do the voice of somebody or the other, which I did. So we were friends. And then Ismail, we met completely separately. 
uh, and he was very anxious, very ambitious, and he wanted mm -hmm. to do plays. I remember him arguing with my husband when I just delivered a little baby. So he was on one side of the bed, and my husband at that time was on the other side, and he was saying, I want name and fame. <laughs> he was very clear in his mind what he wanted. Um, his English wasn't that great at that time. Yeah. And he was ambitious and he wanted to do films. So we thought, you know, Jim is an idea. He wants to do films. You want to do films. And we all collaborated initially on a film called Shakespeare Bala, which was mm. going to star Saeed and me. Yeah. And it was going to be about us going back to India and start a traveling acting group, which was our plan anyway. Yeah. So that was going to be the film, and we would sit on the floor in Jim Ivory's uh, apartment and write this film. And then it all got changed because Said and I divorced, they met the Kendalls, uh, and it changed. The story yeah. changed. But what to do with me? I was still there, their friend. Yeah. So they wrote a role for me as this film actress. That's how I came into that particular frame. Yeah. But you're, I mean, you're absolutely amazing in that role. Uh, I, I, I realise, of course, you probably would have preferred to have been the, the role as that you were supposed to play originally. Right, right. But it changed. Yeah. But I suppose uh, that's showbiz, I guess. Uh, but also... That's yeah, showbiz. <laughs> <laughs> it but is. That relationship with, with Merchant and Ivory, of course, these, these two and names... And Ruth Chabala, whom I knew before. Yeah, well, this sort of this incredible um, creative partnership that went on to make these in films that everybody will know now. Yes. But I love the idea that the sort of the beginnings of that relationship happens in a small flat in New York, whilst whilst you, I, I believe, were sort of, yes. you know, keeping everybody fed with the food that we all now know right. ourselves. Right, right. That's exactly what happened. Uh, there's a lot to be said by keeping uh, those in the creative industries well fed. Uh, by yeah, account, so. no, it makes a lot of difference. <laughs> I think you are more think more creatively. <laughs> so, as I said, um, with with your move then in, into cookery and then becoming a, a very familiar face on British TV screens, um, the the book that you created and that has now got this anniversary edition is one that a lot of people remember. And some of today's most famous cooks still talk about it being an incredibly influential book, but not just that, but one that people will still cook from today because the, the classic dishes haven't changed. And I... I suppose when you were putting together the book in the first place, is it to do with an authenticity of what's in there that means that you can still cook them 40 years later? I don't know the answer to that. People who are cooking from it should answer that. But I just want to say one thing. They asked me to add some new recipes. So what did I add? Yeah. I felt I hadn't put enough of moong dal, which is a, we live on that. It's a dal, one of the easiest to digest dals mm. that you can eat till you die and you can mm. still digest it. But I also put in dishes for goat meat. Mm. Now that was missing in the first, first time around. And I thought there's halal meat all over the country. Yeah. Why can't people just go to the halal meat shop and order like I do mm. and get the goat meat and eat it? Because it's so Indian and it gives them the food of India as opposed to a generalized taste. Yeah. And uh, so I put those dishes in. Uh, they're more salmon dishes. They're more dishes that I make today. Uh, and I feel the English are ready for them. Mm -hmm. they, they just haven't made them all these years, but they, they should try it. They should go to the halal butcher, say hello, and say, can I buy some goat meat? And can I get go baby goat meat because that cooks in an hour as opposed to three hours for the other one? Yeah. So I put all this in the book for people to just not only have the old book, which they will have, but grow and mm. learn. And there's more to India than what I gave you. I'm giving you some more. Yeah. Because I suppose what's interesting is, of course, Indian food is incredibly popular in the UK. Yes. But it's a, a very anglicized uh, version of Indian food that people will be familiar with. So very famously, it was revealed that actually 
the UK's favorite meal was no longer fish and chips. It was chicken tikka masala. Right, right. I remember order, reading that. Yeah. yeah if you try and order chicken tikka masala in yeah. India and nobody's going to know what you're talking about. Because yes, it's not, they, it's not... they actually will. But uh, <laughs> because they've heard it so often and now they must get it in India too. But I think it's the, the other dishes that you get in an Indian home and people have had them in India and restaurants and other places and they want it. Mm. So I'm saying to you, you have the old dishes, but you have some more. Just keep going, keep going. I'm not going to let you stop till I stop. <laughs> <laughs> One of the things you say in the book is that the, the secret, if you like, of, of Indian cookery is is about that familiarity with the spices right. and the different ways in which you can cook spices, which will get different flavours out of And the, the magic spices. of spices, yeah. yes. But I was really interested by the way that you pointed out that the heat that people often associate Indian cookery with is actually a relatively recent addition because, of course, chilies didn't exist in India until much later in its history. Of course, our hot spices were mustard seeds and black peppercorns. Yeah. And if you see, if you go to South India or if you go to places where South Indians went, like Malaysia, you will find old recipes, which I have found in Malaysia, with two or three tablespoons of ground black pepper. Wow. So, you know, we don't cook like that anymore. But if you in Kerala, you yeah. can find such recipes today. Yeah. The old recipes, if you look them up, are full of black pepper. So my ch children are yes. slightly resistant to heat, which is a great upset to my wife and I because we love eating uh, food from all over the world. But trying to get them to eat... Uh, sort of, you know, Indian food or Thai food is a little bit of an uphill battle. Because would you it's spicy? Say that you were a bit, bit, bit too spicy, yeah. So would you say the thing is to actually step away from that sort of spice element? Of course, if you're cooking at home on your own, you don't have to have any chilies in there whatsoever. You can, re you know, rely on the black pepper and the other spices that you mentioned in the book that can give the food the flavour that it should have, but without that heat. Absolutely, you can. And that's how my father somehow was, couldn't eat red chilies either. Mm. So he ate whatever we were eating, eating, but it was made for him specially because we all love spice and he didn't. So he got it without the hot red chilies, but everything else. And it was Indian food. Yeah. It was probably Indian food like it used to be in the 14th and 13th centuries. Yeah, yeah. Um it's an absolutely gorgeous book, this new edition. And as you say, you've added some new dishes uh, for, for people who are familiar with the previous book. Um, it's a very mean thing to ask you, but I just wonder whether there are any <laughs> dishes in there which are real favourites. So that, you know, if you were at home on your own and it was a Sunday afternoon, you were looking for that real kind of comfort food that sort of sparks your brain, as you said, of, of all those memories, what would you be turning to? Well, there are some old dishes and some new dishes that I might turn to. I always love the eggplant, the recipe I got from Udaipur, from the Lake Palace Hotel. Yeah. And, and I will always make that because it's a good dish. <laughs> <laughs> I like to eat it. I assume other people like to eat it. Uh, I will always make the, 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 the baby goat, yeah. which is a new dish. Because I love my meat. I love to eat it. I'm, I can live like a vegetarian. I can eat meat. I can, I, my mother was and grandmother were vegetarian. Uh, my grandmother particularly was a total vegetarian. So I'm used to all kinds of food. But I do occasionally love my, my goat meat. And baby goat is easier to cook. It cooks in one hour. Mm. So I would make an effort to try and get that from a halal butcher, make friends with the halal butcher, just go, make friends, say hi. <laughs> and I, wa I just want some young goat. And I've described what young means in the book, so yeah. you know how many pounds it should weigh. And then cut it into cubes and cook it. It's so delicious. Mm. I'm starting to get worryingly hungry now. Uh, yeah, yeah, uh, good, good. That's the idea. <laughs> <laughs> And have you got any advice for those? Because some people can be a little bit scared of cooking food that they're not familiar with, or or sometimes just simply following recipes. Your yeah. actually your recipes are incredibly detailed. You give really clear instructions. I do step. it because that's how I would like a recipe. I don't want you to say take this, 
add that. Yeah. Stir, uh, stir it for a while and it's done. I don't, don't give me short recipes if I can't follow them. Yeah. I want to know what it should look like at right. each step. So because I was a beginner when I wrote those books, I, I, I understand beginners and I want them to know exactly what they're aiming for, how long they're cooking it, at what temperature they're cooking it, how often are they stirring it. Mm. And I want to help them to get the perfect dish. This is getting away from your, your mother's three-line recipes, of course. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> but she wrote it like that because I guess she didn't know how else to write a recipe. <laughs> she, she assumed I would fill in the gaps. <laughs> Well, listen, Madhu, it's been absolutely fantastic to speak to you um, about, you know, your incredible life and uh, the, the legacy that lives on in this book. It's an absolute joy to read. And uh, I, I'm going to have to cook something from it, I should imagine, this evening because my uh, my mouth is watering. Well, just cook it without the red chilies, and your kids will be fine. Exactly. They'll have no excuse. Yes. We'll get, we'll get them up to speed eventually. But thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Thank you. It was a delight talking to you.